Hi everyone, I, uh, Scott, I really want to thank you. Uh, I can assure you, you saw a, a snippet of this from me and uh, we, we've got the real team here today. So I appreciate it and I'm extremely honored to be here. Uh, several years ago, my son Hunter Gathright, who those of you that have kids, I, I can't tell you how, how often you want to try to impact their lives and I'm here today to tell you how much he impacted mine. He started a quest uh, basically into a passion he had into the fitness world. Uh, he's level three TPI certified. He's gone through uh, more letters and more uh, degrees than you can imagine. Went through the WEC method and uh, actually found GOTA by way of injury. He had two degenerative discs. Uh, we're talking about back surgery. We're talking about all kinds of things. And lo and behold, uh, he went to New Orleans and was told that uh, if he didn't change his training, change what he was doing, he was going to have another back episode at 27 years of age, and three weeks later that happened. So he did a deep dive uh, with the, the team of people that are here today, and, and uh, because of that, uh, I thank you. I can't tell you how much I've learned. Um, one of the things that I, I would say, there's a gentleman named Kurt Pennington uh, who was a member of Cordillera and uh, probably the greatest thing that I witnessed as a, as a coach was I asked Hunter as he got involved with Yoda to really come out and teach me what he learned and I made a comment about flaring a foot out for access for a, a gentleman that's a beginning golfer and uh, I saw the look on his face and I asked him to come forward and uh, that was about three years ago and we've learned a whole lot about movement since then and because of these guys my understanding of, of body control and body movement has made me an incredibly better teacher in the past three years so without further ado I'm going to introduce the team Arthur Robinson uh, Hunter Gathright, obviously, Arthur Robinson, Arthur and Hunter uh, run our Go to Fitness program and our teaching academy over at Sweetwater Country Club in Sugarland. Gary Scheffler, our New Orleans connection. What a pleasant, uh, I, I've gotten to know Gary a whole lot better this week. I, I've known about him for a long, long time, but hadn't known him in person uh, until recently. But Gary is one of the original two gentlemen that that founded GOTA, he opened the, the GLS GOTA Performance Center in New Orleans in 2014. Uh, he's our non-golfer in the group, but uh, for some of the athletes he's trained, a lot of you may recognize Jamar Chase. I think he started working with Jamar in the eighth grade. Uh, Micah Parsons, Odell Beckham, George Kittle. He's had the, the privilege of uh, assessing Bubba Watson. Um, so a deep dive with all the athletes that he's worked with in all the sports. And then the gentleman that's going to be doing most of the talking and presenting today has been a long time friend. Hunter introduced me to him uh, during his early portion of the journey on this and uh, got this deep dive going. Ricky Stancy, for some of you that may be Big Ten football fans, uh, Ricky's very modest, doesn't like to talk about it, but uh, was the starting quarterback at the University of Iowa for three years threw for 7,377 yards, 56 touchdowns, 2011 was drafted by the Kansas City Chiefs, played in the NFL for four years, Canadian League for a year, fought some injuries, did a deep dive with Gary and uh, I present Ricky Stanzi and thank you guys. I think you're going to have some eye-opening things happen today. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Scott, thank you. It's great to be here. I'm really excited to share this knowledge with you guys. Um, like Brian said, I had the privilege, I had the opportunity to play Big Ten football, to move on to the NFL, and right in that transition from really college to pros is where my movement journey started. Um, I was looking for answers. I was falling apart biomechanically, uh, starting to see some non-contact injuries, begin to play my career and I started to kind of try to turn over every rock I could. I started with working with Tom Martinez who was Tom Brady's throwing coach since he was 12. He's since passed on but that was really the first guy that kind of started to peel back the veil for me to kind of look at more of the biomechanics. He was talking about sagittal plane and all this different stuff and kind of using slow motion video and I kept studying and I kept failing and I kept looking for answers and 
throughout really my whole playing career, it stretched about eight years from 2011 to about 18, on and off, had four years in the NFL, had a couple cups of coffee up in the CFL, but all the while I was just gathering information, looking at books, trying to see what was a better way to move. Why were some guys moving really well? What makes Aaron Rodgers throw the ball like that? And why can't I hit a flat route? And so throughout that process, I read a lot, I gathered a lot of information. Uh, I dove into the Western arts, if you will. I was big into the Keller Surrett. I came from Iowa. We did a lot of powerlifting, Olympic lifting. I was understanding what was going on there. But I also looked at the Eastern art, taking a look at pranayama, yoga, martial arts, just trying to get a holistic view on what is efficient movement. I had a lot of dots on the board, but I really didn't have anything that connected all these dots. And I kind of had a breakthrough when I read the book, Muscles and Meridians by Philip Beach. And he started to talk about how nature builds things. He started to talk about how movement and rest are flip sides of the same coin. He started to talk about spinal engine. And I started to look around on Instagram, looking for somebody else. Somebody else has to be saying this, right? Somebody else has to be talking about this. I came from core brace world, don't move the spine. This guy's saying it's wiggling. He's showing me slow motion video of it. I know we all use slow motion video to confirm. Let me go look on Instagram. Luckily, I'd never really been on social media as a player and didn't hear the noise. But once I did, there was really only a couple of groups that were talking about it. And two of those gentlemen were Gary Scheffler and Jose Bosch. We call him Coach Gilly. And Coach Gilly was really the first person that observed what I'm going to show you are the global laws of GOMA. And Gilly's story starts with his back imploding on him, three levels of his back, his lumbar had, had basically degenerated. He was basically face to face with a cage being put in his spine and stopping his movement. He found some relief through the Agassi method, but still when he wanted to kind of ramp up the volume in his movement, he'd always hitch, you know, he'd always get blocked and he wasn't able to kind of overcome that movement piece. Well, like all you great golf coaches do, he went to the slow motion video. And he started with the question, how does a body travel through space for a lifetime and never get hurt for no apparent reason? Why are the non-contacts increasing? Why are the ACLs skyrocketing? Why are the Achilles skyrocketing? Why are the hip replacements, knee replacements, joint replacements in general, why are they skyrocketing? Why can Michael Jordan fly through the air every night in the arena and I can't get on the ground and play with my kids? So Gilly was very intuitive and he looked at really what we call the four super tribes. And those four super tribes are what build up this global laws of Goda. So nothing here was created, it was more so just observed. And he wanted to look for that answer. Why are these people durable? Why are these other people fragile? So he first looked at that crawling baby, those closest to the source, right? What is that telling us? We've been taking it a step further, looking at the embryological perspective of this thing. Muscles and meridians help with that. What does this pattern look like? What does the body look like when it's actually being built out inside the womb, and then looking at it as it moves through its crawling development into its standing, there was a pattern that started to show. Next, he looks at these decade plus super freak athletes that are very durable compared to their counterparts, to their, to their peers. Michael Jordan, Ed Reed, Randy Moss, some of these guys that are able to move at a high level, approach that decade plus mark, and keep those injuries to a minimum. The other group he looked at, was the indigenous cultures, so the hunter-gatherers. You know, we have this, now we have this ability to use the iPad to go back through and comb through a lot of YouTube data, social media data, and there's a lot of great documentaries that are out there that follow these tribes that are deep in the Amazon, the Kurubo tribes, the Yanomame tribes, the Zoe tribes, but naked, barefoot, untouched by chairs, shoes, funny training with barbells, and they look like the baby. So he's gathering this visual knowledge, if you will, these visual vocabulary that are the global laws, he sees it in the baby, he sees it in Jordan, he sees it in the Karubo, and he needed the last piece, which is the elders, right? If this thing's durable, it should be durable from the start to the end. We're built to move forward through space. That forward moving pattern is our walk, run, throw, swing, strength. It's what made us the apex predator. It's how we take down the hunt. It's how we survive. It's what's got us here. So that forward moving pattern, we cycle through it thousands of times a day. I'm sure you guys have step counters on, your phone does it for you now. The, pro the, the pattern being played out thousands of times a day, compound over a lifetime, already implies longevity. So that last group 
was really the elders. When he gets to the elders, he sees the 70 plus age groupers at the track and field world championships, a couple names that stand out, Ida Keeling, Hurricane Hawkins, approaching late 90s, early 100s, puts him down that track, same pattern shows up. And that pattern is what we call the global laws of going. So the first one I got here is columns. And when we're talking about columns, we're really talking about the two sides of the body. So we kind of set the stage for everything else. Let's kind of get a map, or get a visual, should I say, of, of what we are working with here. So we have these two sides of the body, right? And they're going to make up what we call these columns. Inside those columns is really a ball and socket technology. Okay, look at your upper limb, look at your lower limb. It's playing out like a joystick. And it's playing out like a joystick because it has a base. It has a platform. We call it foot control. This platform doesn't move so that the column can move. Everybody knows what a controller is like. For some of us, it's maybe Atari. For our kids, it's the Xbox. But that controller holds still, and then the thumb does the movement. The joystick does the movement. Now, each system of the body is moving something, right? The cardiovascular system is moving blood. Pulmonary is moving hair. Digestive is moving food. What's the musculoskeletal system moving? It's moving pressure. It's moving weight, weight transfer, right? So we're essentially ping-ponging pressure, if you will, back and forth from column to column using sort of a joystick-type technology throughout the system. The foot's going to hold still. It's going to play inside ankle bone high, as we would say. Just that inner ankle bone that you can touch and see is going to have a little bit higher. It's going to be the apex of a sort of half-dome arch structure. You notice your foot, the toes, the size of the toes actually cascade down <coughs> to the pinky, almost like a gutter effect creating a nice half dome that lifts that inner ankle bone high, keeps that column out of collapse, and it lets that joystick of the shin play clean. As the joystick goes, the thigh goes, the torso goes, the bicep, the forearm, and you have sort of this gyroscope energy taking place. When you're looking at nature and you're looking at how she builds out the systems, you're really looking at a pivot point energy system. So if I could, I could take this down to a cell, or we could watch a hurricane or a tornado, there will be a point, and then energy will course around that, right? Cornering energy, as we would say. But when we looked at the Godas, we noticed this tempo, this cycle, this cadence, if you will, playing out. Going back to that systems analogy. Cardiovascular system, pulmonary system. We know there's a tempo, we know there's a cadence, we know there's a rhythm to each of those systems. Musculoskeletal system's no different. There's a rhythm to how the pressure waves in and waves out of that column. Now, for whatever reason, cardiovascular was treated as a system, pulmonary was treated as a system, digestive, I could go on and on, but for whatever reason, we got to musculoskeletal, and they said, hold on, we're gonna chop it up. And we isolated it, and we named muscles, we named ranges, we named planes, and we created a single plane, single range, single muscle sort of training system for everything that kind of multiplied out to where we are now. At Goda, we're saying, no, this thing has a rhythm, has a cadence, has a tempo. It has essentially a healthy blood pressure. We now know what the ideal is. There's norms and there's ideals. Same reason you go to the cardiovascular doctor and they say, hey, here's the ideal blood pressure. You're outside of it. We're going to work to get you back to that ideal. At Goda, we know what the ideal movement pressure is. We know how it's supposed to wave in. We know how it's supposed to wave out. The only way we know this is because of who we study and because we have these tablets in our hands. Because in real time, you can't see it. Right? When pressure works in, you can't see it. It's too quick. But when I can go frame by frame, well, now I can see how each compartment is loading the pressure. I can see how the foot behaves. I can see how the shin, the thigh, Look at your sports organizations. Slow motion video is now becoming sort of the backbone of how they're gonna make decisions on that field because the refs can't see it in real time. So what we saw was a cycle playing out. Each step is gonna play out in this cycle of loading pressure, transferring pressure, and then releasing and resetting over the top. Remember, we're ping-ponging this pressure from one column over to the other column. And at a dull roar, it's my walk, but if I turn it up a little bit, it becomes a jog. If I turn it up a little bit more, it becomes a run, a sprint, a throw, a swing. So sort of like that light dimmer in your house where you turn it on, but it's dim, 
You're always at a dim sort of on when it comes to go to, or you should be. And this keeps the system decompressed and ready to roll, ready to move. Same idea, we would look at top level athletes like Ed Reed. You watch him pre-snap, they're like this, the play gets close to starting, and then they get a little more amped up into what we call athletic position, right? It's still my dress position and the golf position here, but it's that same thing you see in sports. There's this natural movement that we get into when we're gonna move this pressure. When we load that pressure, when we take a step, the way we should load it is we should be inside ankle more high at that platform. Remember the joystick analogy, the foot doesn't move, the shin, the thigh, what are they gonna do? Where is that joystick gonna go? The joystick, what we saw on the GOTAS was it was spinning, it was spiraling, it was using all three planes simultaneously. Remember the cornering energy? It was gonna go down, back, and out, your backswing. You load a backswing essentially on every single step. You put your foot in the ground, you load pressure. Well now that you've loaded pressure, it's like a spiral staircase. You load it down, back, and out, all you gotta do is retrace your steps and transfer it over to the other side. Now you come up, around, and in. You're downswing. So there's a backswing and a downswing to every single, every single step. You can put a club in your hand, you can walk forward and swing that thing, because every single step is an underhand swing. If I want to do an overhand swing, I just got to move my arm over the collarbone line, and now I take that same pattern, and I can throw something. So we're built to throw. We're built for a very simple design, which is forward movement. Look at other animals, they're all built for the same thing. Eyes in the front, big muscles in the back. Rear wheel drive propulsion system, you got that Achilles tendon in the lower limb. The lower limb is a spring. The upper limb can swing. So we're designed to move forward through space. Much like your car, it's rooted in forward movement. If you were to look at a log after the day was over, probably 98% of that day driving was forward, right? 2% is for reverse, nice to back out of the driveway, nice to back out of the parking spot, but you're not gonna go 60, 70 miles an hour on the, down the highway in reverse. Well, our design is much simpler. We are gonna be walk, jog, run, walk, jog, run, walk, jog, run, walk, jog, run, throw, swing, strike, maybe one reverse rep which would be your lift. So we are able to get into reverse, we are able to go backwards, but we're rooted in forward movement. And that's what the global laws are speaking to. We're talking about how we are supposed to move or how our system was saturated as far as the reps went through our day to day. Well now we're a little bit off our mark, so these things start to get a little haywire. When these things get haywire, that's when we see the injuries play in. So as we're loading pressure, and transferring pressure, we need to see something else with the tracking system. So the tracking system is just the head and neck. We have a unique ability to decouple the head and neck from the motor, motor engine. So think motor engine below, visual engine above. It's what allows you to keep your eye on the golf ball as you turn the motor engine one way and turn it the other way. It's what allows the wide receiver to run down field on a go route, turn his head back as the motor engine keeps going. So what we noticed with the GOATAs was, man, that tracking system, it don't move, it stays steady right over the loaded collar, right? I think of Jack Nicholas or Jack Grout holding his head, grabbing his hair behind the ball and saying, don't move, don't move the head. So the head control piece is still there in your walk, in your run, in your throw, in your swing. It should be steady over the loaded collar. So we notice these behaviors starting to play out. And the biggest one here that sort of is an umbrella term and encapsulates all these things above is what we call back chain dominance. So I want you to remove the idea of balance for a second because we're not balanced in certain regards. We're not balanced in forward and reverse. You take way more steps forward than you ever would reverse. And the body instinctively is built for that. The back side will dominate the front side. So more or less, there's this strong sort of almost corset on the back side, outside, that keeps this ball and socket system at length to move that wave as efficiently as it was designed to move. So if we're not dominating with the backside outside tissue, then we start to dominate with the front side inside tissue. And now the root of all evil, regardless of what system you may be looking at, cardiovascular, pulmonary, digestive, like we said before, if you went into any one of those doctors and they found the problem, the root problem was compression. We, they know there was a flow, they know there was a cadence, a rhythm, a tempo that was healthy, You've got compression somewhere, and there's a hitch. There's something that's missing in your cycle. Musculoskeletal system moves pressure. 
We can't touch or really see pressure, but we can see in slow motion. Now we can start to see where is the hitch? Where is the compression? Where have we gone wrong in one of these global laws? And once we see that in assessment, now we start to correct it. So back chain dominance is really just saying the whole system needs space to properly load and transfer the pressure. Now I'm going to go to these big ticket concepts right here for a second. <clears throat> Let's show some examples of what we're looking for. So remember, to rehash columns, each side of the body, largely a ball and socket type technology. It's moving multi-planar, sagittal, frontal, transverse, all at the same time, like a spiral staircase, sitting inside that foot complex, down, back out, up, around, and in. But when we're just standing, it should show something. It should show a certain length. Or let's say it did show us something. When we look at the indigenous cultures, when we look at the children, we saw level shoulders. We saw level hips. We saw level knees, level ankles. And at the base, there was this almost alien-looking foot to what we would see if we took off our shoes. They got this wide base. This inner ankle bone pops high. They a nice, strong arch. And they're about a fist-width distance apart. Now we fast forward to what most of us look like, or we've done a lot of assessments at this point, and the majority of us start to fall into what we would call a WOTA type category. So GOTA stands for greatest of all time actions. WOTA stands for worst of all time actions. Essentially, when you take the GOTA away, you start to suffocate it a little bit. We start to lose the levels to kind of see an under the hood type of look of what that might be. The unlevel shoulders, unlevel hips, pre-cornering of a ball and socket or a coupled motion torso, essentially saying short spots, right? Compression. Not enough space to move, even as we see it standing there. Remember, you're built to move forward. So your standing is a reflection of when you're getting ready to prepare for that pressure to enter in and then transfer out. So if I see stuff like this at the onset, I know there's already compression in this young athlete's system. I'm sure you're looking at your golfers in your mind right now, we just did a bunch of assessments the other day, everybody's feet are flared, everybody's inside ankle bone low, everybody's got some sort of compression that's building into their system. And how is this happening? Well, basically the two big culprits, we're sitting in them and we're wearing them on our feet, the shoes and the chairs, right? Going back to that Philip Beach book, Muscles and Meridians, his theory was, well, all the animals are resting on the ground to keep tuned. So movement and rest are flip sides of the same coin, how I rest is then going to set up how I move. So you don't have foam rollers, spare guns out in the wild, but you do have your resting patterns. And you guys that have kids or nieces or nephews, you have already seen these patterns. The kid comes out of the womb and they just instinctively jump into these patterns of really what we call upside down, inside ankle and high, crisscross applesauce, Japanese sitting posture, seiza. And this is across culture all over the world, semi-indigenous cultures, fully indigenous cultures, children. These things just pop out, their behaviors. You ain't got to teach your kid how to walk. You don't have to teach them how to run, throw or swing. If you have kids, they will throw stuff, they will swing it, and then they'll try to rest on the ground. Then you got to teach them how to sit in the chair. So now all of us are stuck in these chairs on a day to day. The columns start to get wrecked, and then the foot control starts to get messed up. So ideally, it should look something like this. You kind of look at this photo over on the right. You'll see what we would call our pressure map. Like, where do we want to have the majority of the pressure to create this inner ankle bone high apex, right? To keep the half dome strong. It's a half dome arch type structure, so I don't want to surf the pressure off the inside, the cliff side of the foot. I want to kind of cascade pressure down to that funnel that is the pinky toe corner. In order to do that, this is what the pressure map would look like. Your big toe's still in contact, we got yellow there to be cautious, right? But the majority, the ribeye of the foot, is really two through five, all the way down into that fourth and fifth metatarsal. And then the heel, it's got nothing to do with your forward movement. Think of the big cat. Think of the big cat's heels are up, think of the wolf. The heels are up, you stand that thing up to be bipedal, you shouldn't just collapse into the heel. You should still keep that heel at a hover. We say credit card alignment for simplicity. I should almost feel like I could place a piece of filler paper or a credit card underneath my heel when I'm standing, when I'm walking, and that would be the dull roar, that would be the one. Looking at it in this sense, it'd be the one on my inside ankle bone high. But now when I go to ramp up, right, remember, depending on how much pressure I'm going to put into the system, the swing has a lot of pressure, the throw has a lot of pressure, the run, I need to get more inside ankle bone high. 
Because now I gotta open the joystick even more to sort of hold that pressure, to load that pressure. So we have this foot control piece at the bottom, and it's being compressed on a day-to-day -day from all the weird shoes we wear. We tighten up the toe box, we elevate the heel, we put on a flip-flop sandal, we squeeze the big toe to the second toe. But when you look at the children that are usually barefoot, they got a nice big wide toe. We saw the same thing in our indigenous cultures, the Karubos, the shoeless tribes, have this wide baby foot. They look like adult babies. It almost looks alien to us, because none of us look like this anymore, because we're off our mark, we're sitting in chairs, we're wearing shoes. And so when we have this compression take place at the foot level, it starts to mess with our loading pattern. So remember we talked about we're gonna load pressure, backswing, right? We're gonna then transfer pressure, downswing. So every time that I'm loading pressure, we call it a bow, because the kids at the gym are like, hey, Coach Gary, that kind of looks like that kind of looks like a bow when you always draw it on my leg when you're doing assessments. Bow it is. Because it's a language that everybody can understand now. It takes back from the T-I-O-N words that were really just cadaver signs to begin with. Remember, all the systems are integrated systems until we get to musculoskeletal. Why? What's sagittal? What's frontal? What's transverse if they're not all together? What's glute? What's hand? What's calf if they're not all together? What's hip? What's ankle? What's foot? If they're not all together, these things don't exist outside of being in a system. So when you watch a system operate, you watch a system hold pressure, this is what the go to does. This is the healthy backswing. Look at the lace line, tongue line, sock line trending high. Notice how the shin, the joystick, is able to open. The shin and the thigh have to be on the same page. If this is a ball and socket, well, that's got to be a ball and socket. Otherwise, this thing tears every single time with the chicken wing. So that's a hinge, that stays healthy because these two are on the same page. Those two stay on the same page because the foot is given a nice platform to open as I load pressure and then to close as I transfer pressure. A lot of us are now starting to see this enter into our population more and more rapidly. It's very hard to find a go to 10 because a lot of us are obviously, we're all stuck in chairs, we're all wearing shoes, and then we train with a single plane, single range mindset. More times than not, the foot's collapsed. It's starting to bring the shin inward, starting to bring the thigh inward, and we lose that nice bow type behavior that I see here on the right, versus a collapsed behavior that I start to see on the left. The body wants to bow, right? It wants to corner. If you take a look at the embryological perspective, this was the work by Philip Beach. You just watched and you looked at how the body was developing. Spine develops first, and then the limb buds are going to spiral out from there. Well, your lower limb actually is set on a spiral inward, uh, all the way down Russian doll effect into the Achilles tendon. So, in order to sort of take the slack out and build integrity, you spiral <coughs> outward. So when you spiral outward, like we know on our backswing, we load up that pressure. We get into that backside, outside tissue, and we sit there almost like a catapult, and then we can launch from there. So we spiral out to load up, and then we're going to spiral in to release. This is what we call the corner. Okay, so cornering energy, downswing, transfer of pressure, right? Everybody here has got the, the mats with the pressure weight. You see a wave of pressure, waves into one column, and then it waves out into the other column. The wave out would be your transfer. How you transfer is just retracing your steps from that bow. So if I can pop up here, Jordan, you'll see the kneecap now start to point inward. As the inner ankle bone stays high, when we take that energy and we send it around the corner correctly, we should release the collar. When we release properly, we see the elbow away, the heel away. Take that to your golf swing, you've seen it a hundred times. Right? The heel flicks away. The heel flicks away. Because we're sending energy away from the midline. We load it up on a backswing, chest, kneecap, point out, chest, kneecap, point in. There's a spiral energy taking place. The foot platform has to hold still. So you see elbow away, you see heel away, and the only thing that's missing in the golf swing would be the reset. So your bow, <coughs> corner release. And then if I wanted to walk forward, you'd have something like a Gary Player drill. Bow, corner release, reset, and now I'm into my step, right? I'm moving forward. So we're taking that cycle through our day to day. Bow, corner release, and then we're gonna reset over the top. Now, as we were loading that pressure, we need to have that tracking system steady in the collar. The so tracking system stays steady in the column as I load that pressure. In order to load that pressure and transfer it efficiently, we gotta be back chain dominant. Simply put, tail back, crown forward. 
And this one everybody knows. We've seen it a hundred times. This is a non-negotiable in golf, correct? Sort of a global law in golf. It's because it's forward movement. You gotta keep your tailbone back. You kinda gotta keep the forward, the head forward, crown forward, tail back, because it lets you open and close the columns. What we've even seen some of these great golfers recently is that line that you draw in a dress, they almost push through that line as they get down into impact. People are looking for that, right? They're trying to go after it. One law that's not being observed, though, at the golf level is at the foot. So if you can tie it all together, we can build more durable golfers. That's where Goda can kind of step in and start to help the golf community is that we can take this basic forward moving pattern, we can assess for it. After we assess for it, we, sell, we now build awareness. So now everybody now knows, you've already seen these patterns. Nothing here is created, it's just observed. You can think back to your athletes. You know it's on a straight foot when they're crooked foot, you never even really took a true assessment. So now with that knowledge, here's Woda, here's Goda, we got a spectrum, now we can pinpoint where our athlete is on that spectrum. Then we can start to put the inputs in to move them back towards a healthy range. Now like Brian said, me and Gary were not really the golfers. We would deal with more of the 90% of the round, 90% of the day-to-day. 10% -day. is your swing, 10% is your shot. What about the 90% of the course management as far as movement goes? There's a lot of walking steps that go into playing golf at the highest levels, right? There's a lot of putts that you have to read. There's a lot of squats you have to embark on. There's a lot of bending down to the ground. What if your athlete's inefficient in those things? I bet you the third or fourth round will be a little more troubling. We've seen it a hundred times, shaking your head, all these coaches know, man, that third day is like, my guy falls off. What's he missing? Well, he's on the grind, it's not easy. You gotta walk all those miles, you gotta put all that time on that pattern, and you don't even know if it's efficient or not. So athletes are working so hard. We had a couple of good speakers come up and talk about all this performance, performance, but your best ability is availability. If you're not available, you can't get better. Your greatest hindrance to performance is pain. If you can remove pain from the equation, you'll see the performance jump. So now there's a whole other 90% for not only us as instructors, but for our pupils, for our students. How they walk, how they sit, how they stand, all those things matter. If you're not getting better, you're getting worse. We know this as coaches. If you're not staying Goda, you're moving towards Woda. If you're moving towards Woda, you're moving towards compression. If you're entering compression into any system of the body, you are asking for it to be injured. So there are certain non-negotiables, we know this in golf, like we just said, the tail back, crown forward. <coughs> There's non-negotiables to the design of the body. It's finite, it's limited, right? It's built perfectly, but it's finite and it's limited. Just like we show with the musculature of the limbs, we don't get to decide that. I've never sewn an Achilles tendon, they just come out that way, I have to observe and then train accordingly. So when we're looking at the body and we're looking at how it's set up, it has to load and it has to transfer a certain way. So there's your cycle of forward movement. This is how it stays durable. We now have found that sort of healthy blood pressure, if you will, and it's got to be in this specific pattern. It can be done perfectly, but it takes a lot of reps, takes a lot of input, but it does take first and foremost awareness. So what we've done is we've built a system centered around assessing something putting it through correctives, and then ramping it up to what Gary does best, which is performance. So it has the same feel that we've all been used to, get an assessment, correct something, ramp up that tension, ramp up that speed, and go into performance. But now, instead of entering into this tunnel through strength, which has always been the focus, strength, speed, strength, speed, you can be strong and fast and still not be durable. But if you're durable, you've already implied that you're strong. Something's durable, it's strong. Go back to the forward and reverse concept, right? I can lift weights with explosive power in reverse. I can lift, I can deadlift, I can power clean, I can do backflips, I can do the high jump. So we can create torque in this reverse pattern, but it's not durable to what we're built for. Goda says we gotta saturate the nervous system in forward because outside of being a power lifter or an Olympic lifter, all of our athletes are rooted in forward movement. They're rooted in these global laws, and we're not training for them. We're not assessing for them. We don't even really know what they are. So now that we know what they are, now that we can assess for them, then we can start to train for them. When we train at Goda, we train with durability as the forefront in our minds.
We train that body to be durable through that perfect pattern. And then as we're creating more up levels in their durability, they're seeing strength, they're seeing speed start to increase at the same time. Anybody have any questions on any of that? It's all I know. Yeah. 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 So, so injury prevention, obviously. Um, have you done any studies on that like, off posture initial and getting ready to force production? Like, you know, is it you can in the show? Or? Yeah, we would say like simple, simple stuff. Like Brian was alluding to it a little bit was you know straighter feet. Now I know a lot of us talk about flared feet, or we will work with flared feet. We saw this sort of take place in other areas too, where remember the population's being pulled more so towards WOTA. So your golfers are showing up with crooked feet. You don't really have much to work with. What GOAT is trying to do is now you have an assessment, and maybe they won't get that on day one, but they at least have an awareness of what they can try to fix. And then you can start to put in the corrective exercises, which will start to, the goal is to help straighten out the foot, to help create a decompressed foot compartment that can actually do that at full speed. We know how fast the club is moving. If they don't have a straight foot when they're standing and walking, they won't have a straight foot when they go to swing. Think of that sort of volume being turned up on the dial. When I'm walking or standing, we see our assessment, it starts with a walk, or it starts with the standing profile, full 360. Then we do the squat, because your squat is your loading of pressure. That would be coding for the bow, your backswing. Then your toe touch would be your corner, your transfer, your downswing. So by looking at those base movements that are just there, we do them every single day, we don't even notice them, we get an idea of like, okay, I know what's gonna happen in the walk. I know what's gonna happen in the run. And so we show them, hey, look, the way you're standing, the way you're walking, the way you're doing these base things, we gotta clean that up first. Because when you go to put the club in your hand, it's over 100 miles an hour. So if we're not doing it right at the beginning, and this is where the 90% comes in, we can clean up that 90% along with their awareness as an athlete, and then getting them those correctives throughout the day, over time, as you're cueing it on the, on the range, you'll start to be able to get the foot to play a little bit straighter. You'll start to be able to get the foot to play a little more inside ankle and high over time. And then those things like back chain dominance. You know, if you, have a, if you have a golfer that's fighting early extension, you can't figure it out, but all day they sit in a chair like this, where the tail is forward and the crown is back. Then they go to a gym where they do deadlifts all day and hand cleans all day, and the tail goes forward and the crown goes back. And now they've got the core set on backwards, and they're suffocating the musculoskeletal system. And then you get up there and you say, hey, get your tail back. And they're like, I, I don't have any space. And my body is a servant. Your nervous system is a servant to the environment. It's not smart in the sense that it will auto-correct you. So if you tell it to walk crooked feet, it walks crooked feet. If you tell it to sit tail forward, crown back, it sits tail forward, crown back. Then we ask them to do this big wave of motion to keep this tail, they keep doing this. They keep doing this and you can't figure it out. Well, now you've got a training system, you've got an assessment to figure it out, see what they're missing, and then you can start to work on exercises to give them the ability to do what you want through that backsling and downsling. 90% of the time, you're not going to fix it at where the goal's at. Like, you're not going to fix it when they stand in front of you getting ready to swing. It's fixed through the process, through the evaluation and decompression phase. Because, you know, I mean, like all y'all coaches, you, and I coach, my background was basketball, so I could tell a kid to use a certain form all the time, but if he don't have access into the back chain, he, he could try his hardest, but he's going to mess it up once the bullet's going to fly. Once he's out there, he's just swinging, and, you know, he, he's... Yeah, so I guess cleaning up the 90% will increase somebody for it will be 100%. Because yeah, once you get everything back to pieces. In other words, basically we identified a blueprint from a human body. Anything outside of that blueprint is going to create some kind of inefficiency, no matter what your sport is. Even if you just want to go from your, your living room to go get the mail out of the mailbox, somebody in my back hurts on the way back in. You, you know, you can clean that up. You can give people a more comfortable life. So it's a therapeutic side along with a performance side. What about using insoles and stuff to start there? I know out on the PGA Tour there's a company called Come Out. They come out called A-Line insoles. That's, that's a great question because yeah. they everywhere, right? You walk in Walmart, yeah. walk, they everywhere. That is a passive approach. Um, we take a more aggressive approach. We want the foot to actually become active and, and take care of itself. Um, I know I deal with a lot of high school athletes and stuff like that. If you get into really good inserts, 
you spend some money. Yeah. And if you got a kid that's going from an a, a, a eight to an eight and a half, and I mean, they, they go up two shoe sizes in a year. Next thing you know, you spent $1,000 on inserts when you could have bought a $79 program on our website and activated the speed. Okay. The other part of that too is shoe choice. I mean, if you look down, the golf shoes are tough. Like, right, a lot of tight toe boxes. Um, the company True Linkswear is building out a more minimalist approach. Uh, I'm a Jordan, we're Nike guys, so Jordan. The Jordan 1s, the Golf Lows, excellent shoe. It's got what you're looking for in a shoe, to keep it simple, is really three things are, built, are building out these minimalist shoe designs. Wide enough toe box. Now that one, whatever fits your foot. So if it's wide enough for your foot to splay, check that box. If it's tightening down, you feel it tight on the big toe, you're going to flare your foot because, well, if your foot was straight, your big toe would run into your shoe, and it's really uncomfortable. When I played pro ball, our guys would actually cut an X at the toe box of the cleat because everyone's toes were running into the shoe. So that's the first problem. If the toe box is tight, insole won't matter. That part of the insole, the arch support, like Gary said, it's really the, these insoles, in theory, they're great, but in approach, they're still passive. Like, the nervous system needs an active input. Right down there at the capsule level, it's not very vascular, meaning there's force transmissions that are telling it what to do. So the behavior at your foot level will eventually lead to a higher arch. So if you had an arch support in your shoe, you'd almost want to hover that arch. Most people are using like a sofa. They're just resting on it and then they take their insert out and they don't have their insert for a weekend trip and they blow their back off. They're dependent on it because it's a passive approach. It does bring relief, but it doesn't solve the root cause. The next piece would be heel elevation. Ideally, it's a zero drop, right? Your foot is on a zero drop plane. That's where the Achilles is going to be at its best. The foot's going to be at its best. Well, now we've kind of put the heel into the shoe. That starts to shorten the Achilles, starts to do a bunch of weird things. But if you can get something that's minimal heel lift, to so like I said, the Jordans or True Links, where it'll actually be a zero drop shoe from heel to toe, no elevation. So if you can find those three things, or at least Non-negotiable will be the toe box. The inside, the, the foot support, the insole should be a non-factor essentially. You could almost use it to give you a little awareness in a sense, but that heel would be that second piece. Don't get too big of the heel elevation. Try to keep it kind of very quiet. Hey, Rick, yeah. would you explain to them cuboid versus heel? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a great question, or a great sort of visual. Um, okay, so real quickly, ball and socket, Think of that joystick analogy, right? There's my controller, there's my joystick. So this is the gliding surface of the talus. We plug in, inside ankle bone stays high, now I can whip and flip that shin in harmony with the thigh. Now, this bone right here, this would be the right foot on the underside, this is the cuboid bone. So we'll give you to the cuboid bone to lay pressure into your golf swing. We just don't want to get this guy involved. We don't want to fall into the heel. A simple cue we give to our athletes, eggshell heels. So eggshell heels don't crack the eggshell, right? So I want to be in the cuboid of the foot, that's fine, but I don't want to get too heavy into, this would be the top side, I don't want to get too heavy into the heel. So if you kind of look at that talus, notice the, the, the design, notice the architecture of it, that's the ball and socket, it's just forward facing, right? So this is why it's troubling when they say, well, the ankle's a hinge. If it was a hinge, you'd be a robot. You'd have to move like this, and you can never turn and swing. You'd have to literally do this to turn because your ankle was a hinge. So we can turn and move in this sort of chaotic way because we're set up off of a basic sort of like joystick analogy. And that inside ankle bone high, it really butts up to this point right here. So you got this big, strong cuboid bone, but you just don't want to get, and where it actually trips is this trip wire. Next thing you know, you're in your heel. And you'll be heavy in the heel. When you get into the heel, you lock up the talus. When you lock up the talus, now the shin stops moving, but think of like what's led to a lot of front leg destruction from like Dustin, Brooks, Michelle Wee, uh, Tiger. That heel gets down, the leg goes straight, the shin stops, but guess what's still going? Everything above it, thigh keeps going, torso keeps going, all of it's going, and then something has to give. The knee's just a hinge, it's just ligaments in between. So that, all that energy is still going with a blocked leg or a stuck shin is blowing up people's knees. We see it in the quarterback world, we see it in the baseball world, the pitching or the batter, 
And we see it in golf, right? Because it's all, it's all, you got a floor level swing, you got a chest level swing, and you got an overhead level swing. It's still packing pressure and then transferring it over to the other side. When pressure gets there, it's really non-negotiable. We have to play along with the design of that foot that kills. Great question, though. So, so where are you guys on, uh, I'm going to say, uh, the way Brian mentioned it earlier, a uh, foot flare in the golf setup? It's, it should be unnecessary. It should be unnecessary. It should be unnecessary. If that talus is decompressed from that platform, then that chin should be able to open. That would be ideal. Right, right. ideal. Remember, ideals and norms. Like you're thinking of all the norms you have, right? Norms are not necessarily good, right? We know what's normal in our population. Like we assess a lot of people. We don't see any back chain dominance anymore. We see it in the indigenous, we see it in the baby, but we don't see it in our population. So the new normal is front chain dominance. Inside ankle bone high is the ideal. We don't see it as often, because the new normal would be inside ankle bone low. So you're trying to go for the ideal, but at the moment of the norm, you're aware of it. And that norm is gonna be that assessment, then you'll start to work with them towards the ideal. Day one, you can maybe, this is where you can start, so I gotta coach quarterbacks, when we're warming up and it's nice and easy, I'll, I'll bark out, hey, balls the feet, straight foot, balls the feet, straight foot. When it's time to actually go to seven on seven, it's time to actually hit that seven iron, like Scott was showing you all those, you're playing the game, you, you don't got time for inside ankle high. You have to have already had it in the system. The good thing about this, and it's kind of the bad thing, it's subconscious, right? Your movement patterns are subconscious, thank goodness, right? Imagine trying to think about all that, we're trying to take one step, you get nothing done. So it's gonna go back to the subconscious, there's a heavy install early, but the more you kind of bring it around the nervous system and the athlete sees it, you see it, you build a simple language that everybody can understand, it becomes like, oh, we're only, like you coach a lot, of, I mean, Gary's always coaching athletes, after a while they go, oh, we're doing the same thing every time. Yes, <laughs> yes, it's the exact same thing every time. After a while, you don't need as much sort of tutelage, and now they can kind of start to auto-correct as they go. Talk, talk a little bit about compression. So foot flares doesn't necessarily be compression <coughs> the hip sockets or the No, it's a compensation. Yeah. If that hip's blocked, right? So like if you're, remember, you got this cornering action, right? And so they they figured out two of the three. I, I teach this to my swing athletes. Like you got to have three of these things ideally. Foot control, compression control, which is your tail to crown relationship, and then head control. The golf world's got the two. Y'all got head control and you got tail to crown. That one's set, people fight for those. But foot control, because you have this reverse engine, which is your lift, so when you go to lift, you just do the exact opposite of forward movement. Now, instead of being heels high, inside ankle bone high, you can go crooked foot, inside ankle bone low, and you dig your heels into the ground. Instead of starting the pressure or loading the pressure with a turn outward, you actually turn the shin inward. So my point being, you have a way to turn your shin inward during your downswing, collapsing the foot. And that's where it becomes troubling because you can, as we would say, cut the corner of the big toe as you turn the shin in, but most athletes don't know that they could keep the inside ankle bone high as they turn the shin in. You've seen this. If you look at a lot of golf swings, you've noticed that some athletes, when that back knee, if they're a right-handed golfer, when that back knee starts to go in, the heel is actually shooting up and away. And there's almost this curve on the inner ankle bone. What you've also seen is that knee goes in, the heel tracks down and in, and there's almost a collapse at the inner ankle bone. So that would be the bad version. The good version would be the heel tracking away. It just means that the ankle and the hip are now oscillating on the same tune. You won't cut off anything. You won't create a <coughs> You won't beat up their knee. Once again, if you saw that in their driver or the foreiron, we have to regress, go back. Those are big swings, a lot of speed, but it would just be part of the assessment process. So, with some of the older people that we work with, let's say, you know, like our average club golfer, mm -hmm. what's the timeline that you've seen for these things to be in? Great question. So, early on, your goal is to start the decompression process, right? Remember, they, you don't get a big bicep after one bicep curl, right? So, there's a timeline that has to be playing out, and because I can't waterboard that nervous system. We try to spoon feed it early on. So we'll give them an assessment, we'll give them the awareness, hey, here's Woda, here's Goda. Unfortunately, Stan, you're right here, okay? But that explains why you're hurt. Now you have an actual answer. Now we can start to move them this way. As long as they're doing this diligently and trying to, 
They should see the pain go down. Remember what we said, pain is gonna be the biggest hindrance to their performance. If you can bring down pain, even just pain, in your average golfer, they'll feel better. If they're feeling better, there's more mental clarity. If there's more mental clarity, the performance starts to increase. So, albeit they may not see a huge difference right away in their forward run, that would actually get to the point where like, we actually load like one column, we'll do a bunch of isometrics, you have to get to that point to start to really see your sprint get different. You need that for your, you know, your college golfer, your pro golfer. But your regular Joe, if you can just get them to do their daily groundwork, get them an understanding of, hey, understanding in the clubhouse matters. If you can get a little bit more like this, they'll start to feel better. And they should at least be out of pain very quickly, if not within the session, a couple sessions. But then as they extrapolate that out, we usually start with like a three-week template. By the end of the third week, most people are like, okay, I'm ready for more. It's just, we start them on the ground, then we'll move them to like a wall, make sure like your butt against the wall for a little bit of awareness with tail to crown and we'll have a little support there. We use pivot points and support. So remember, pivot point is what's in the ground. Ultimately, when you go to move, you only get one pivot point. And you gotta course that energy around that pivot point. The baby has six or eight. So we can get them down to hands, knees, tops of the feet. More pivot points, it's a lot easier to organize these global laws, then we just progress. We go with the four pivot points. We go to two with support, one with support, one with no support. We work them through the system like that. We, we basically reverse engineer human movement is what we did and went back and started from the beginning and build you back up. They, they, we don't have time, but go to movement.com is, um, is our website. Uh, you can go there and then if you got the Instagram handles. But we're going to stick around for lunch. So if anybody's got any questions, and then uh, I believe they're going to drop you a PDF in the post email thing that we have that will explain everything to you. It's kind of got this stuff in it, how to reach us, different products that we have, and stuff like that. Yeah, well, appreciate you. Got, you got, you got oh, okay. oh, six. I thought you said two. You can't say 20. 20. That's why you want to slow motion video. Yeah, I need oh, a yeah. camera to do that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, no, any. Go ahead, keep firing questions. Right now. Can you can you do an assessment on somebody? Sure. Mm -hmm. Come on. Well, I came to the squad. I just had you. So. Oh, well, I saw you standing there with the crooked feet, though. Yeah. 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 Okay, so, so we got Scott here. So our basic assessment is going to be a full 360 standing profile. 
A full 360 squat and toe touch profile. Remember, the squat would be the landing, the hinge would be the leaving, and then we'll have you walk and we'll, we would have you run, but for simplicity, we can still get what we need here. So remember, we went back and we talked about, this is how I would generally bring this up to an athlete. I first show them columns. And I'd be like, okay, remember, we want level shoulders, level hips, level knees, level ankles. We'd like to see that foot Complex be about fist width distance apart, inner ankle bone high. Hey, Rick, before yeah. you get off that scroll up, I'm showing that guy above in the, in the basketball shorts there. Oh, Kobe? No, oh, Kobe? That's young Kobe right there. Yeah. So we get it at birth, and then we just lose it as we go. So then we pop back here, and this is what we generally see. Oops. Okay, so then we would generally see this, right? Most of us start to get, zoom in on the foot here, we start to get feet outside the columns, so we lose outside that fist width distance apart. We start to get crooked feet, and then remember the joystick analogy, okay? So the foot starts to get crooked, the inner ankle bone, and we've had a lot of golfers, and we see a lot of tan lines, which actually helps your eyes see this, this slope, the cascade of where that shin's gonna go. Right, so like crazy glue, if I have that joystick, I have my controller, and then I take that controller to the inside, and then I dump crazy glue into the outside, I lose my ability to turn the shin outward. I lose my inside ankle bone high. So we see this a lot in our population where the feet get wide, the feet get crooked, and the shins start to turn in. Now if I take that, and you can see the same thing on the back side, spin around, let me go back here. So you'll see it from the back side as well, right? Feet crooked, inside ankle bones dropping low. Now, if I have that pattern at standing, then I go and I take that pattern into my landing, what do we see? It just gets louder, right? Remember, I turn up the dial. If I'm standing, it's at a dull roar. I should be at the one on that scale of 10. Well, now as I start to squat, I'm putting more and more pressure into the column. I'm loading up, that'd be your back swing. So it's essentially like two back swings in a sense. See how crooked the right foot is? Scott, do you have any history of anything? Back pain. Back pain? Yeah, kick by a horse. Kick by a horse. That's a new one. I haven't heard that one yet. <laughs> is it, is it, do you, do you notice more things on the right side than the left side? Uh, center. Center, just the whole thing? Okay. So, either way, we'd be telling the athlete, we've seen it play out both ways. So you'll see something where maybe an early trauma to an athlete, a contact injury, even a non-contact injury, almost shuts off one side of the body. That one side gets super tight. That's their tight side, right? Then they'll go and they'll hang out on the other side all day. They'll just keep the pressure over there, their head stuck. Then the chronic pain starts to show up on that side. The hip starts to bother them. So what we try to do is bring more symmetry, in a sense, to the ability to load the pattern. If I'm doing a double leg squat, it's a bilateral pattern. So I really have about 50-50 of the pressure, if you will, in both columns. When we go to swing the club, we're getting like 70-30, 80-20. We're trying to load up the one side and then transfer over to the other side. So when we see sort of imbalance in the squat, we see the foot start to get crooked. Back to the early part of this talk, unlevel shoulders, unlevel hips, pre-turns, stuck. I can't get that shin bone to open. So if I'm looking at an ideal squat, I'd see something like this, right? So the baby has this ability to keep the feet straight, to keep the inner ankle bone high, and then the shins can open, right? They don't have the crazy glue in the outside corner of the capsule like we all do that forces our shin inward. If I don't disturb that pattern, and I'm a, a, a butt-naked barefoot tribesman, it's still there. Right? Because they don't have, they're never going to lose it, right? They're going to be butt naked, barefoot. They have to use those patterns. They have to use those resting shapes throughout their day to day. It's a fact of life. You're a hunter gatherer. The gatherer portion would be your squat and your hinge. You interact with the ground, you rest on the ground. Then when you go to hunt, you just combine the bow in the corner, the squat and the hinge to propel you forward to get into attack mode to eventually throw or swing to make the kill. Now we just fast forward to where we create sports, 
Interestingly enough, we make the objects sort of, we build them around what we do. Club face opens and closes. Why? Because you open and you close. The football spirals. Why? Because you spiral. So we make the object so we can exploit it. So we shouldn't have to lose these things. So that's where I generally show the athlete, hey, this is what you could do, but here's what starts to happen when we get into sort of this sed sedentary lifestyle. He's cutting me off. Because I want you guys to know. <laughs> That thing's still showing? No, it's not showing. There it is. Okay. Okay, here we go. All right. Where we left off? The squat. So now this is the normal. We see the feet, because remember the hip wants to open, right? So the, I'm going to make something happen at the foot and ankle level to get that hip to open. So what more or less has happened to our population is our foot and ankle should have this healthy disassociation, right? I should be able to hold that foot still, remember the platform, I can wind up that shin in accordance with the hip. If my foot and my ankle are nice and they have a good glide and slide, I can get my feet really close and I can sit down into my squat. If I don't have that foot and ankle anymore, I'll just make something up. I'll compensate. Essentially, we get a foot ankle glued together. We try to get it to get on the same page as the hip. But the problem with this is, in order to wind up that ankle, what we've seen is you need a straight foot. Think of torque. You need a straight foot, and then the kneecap would point outside that straight foot. If you do that in your own, as an experiment, you'll notice you wind up your ankle. So when we go crooked foot, you don't really wind up the ankle. Instead, what's happening right here for Scott is, his foot's going one way, his shin's actually going the other way, and then his thigh's sitting back. So now you've got compression in the system, you're at risk for either knee pain, back pain. Where the pain is or where the injury is, isn't so much as important to us as what the root behavioral issue is. Because we've seen plantar fasciitis, we've seen shin splints, we've seen bunions, knee tendonitis, hip problems. We get a general idea of where you might be, but more importantly, we now have to fix that behavior. We won't treat that area, we'll treat the behavior as a whole. That will start to bring length, decompression. We've got length, we've got space. Now the thing can breathe. We don't stop the flow. So once we see that squat, then we see the toe touch. If you had the shorts on, generally those shorts, we can see the kneecaps, because the kneecap sort of becomes the scope for my hip and my ankle. So the kneecap pointing out is telling the hip and the ankle are winding up. Kneecap pointing in, telling the hip and the ankle are winding in. So our squat, we want to see it point out on a straight foot inside ankle bone high. So we don't just teach flexibility or suppleness, we teach inside ankle bone high suppleness. So you need to be supple with the inside ankle bone high foot. That will calculate towards an actual decompressed system. Otherwise, you can just do crazy things with the foot. You can compensate to get down. We don't want to have that. So the kneecap should point in, the kneecap should point out. But what's important is, what you want to see is when you go to walk forward, now remember this is the dull roar of the walk, so I got a golfer, they come in, they're showing with their back swing. Right? I can't get them to sit into that back pocket, they're losing power, they're losing efficiency, they're also having back problems, hip problems. They're also walking on the course like this. Okay? So the way they were standing in front of you, the way they were squatting in front of you, just becomes their loading pattern. So now when Scott goes to load pressure into his right leg, what do we see? We see the, sil the same similarities that we saw in his standing, we see the same similarities that we saw in his squat. And we see those things show up in his walk pattern. So now, this column that should open up on top of a straight foot inside ankle bone high, it's now crooked foot and it's collapsing. So everything is actually playing out much straighter than it should. He should have a kneecap that opens a little bit, it'll be quiet on the walk, but more importantly, his spine shouldn't be stuck straight. Okay, your torso region is a facet joint technology. It's a facet joint design, design. Basically saying, you bend the spine once, you bend it twice, and the chest points out. So it has a wiggle that has to adhere to the ball and sockets. So it's Friat's second law. Flexion or extension, you slide side <clears throat> to that side, your chest points. Right, so you have this chest pointing out when you walk, when you run, when you swing. When our athletes, our golfers, have this straight spine, well, that, that's all pressure in the torso. So now it's not a surprise that, well, Scott has back problems. His torso isn't on the same page 
as his shin and his thigh. Somewhere along that chain, the kinetic chain, there's, there's a break, there's a compression, there's not a sort of harmony between each segment as we work up from the foot. And that's what we would, now we would work Scott into some basic groundwork, keep it nice and simple, let him start to sort of spoon feed his nervous system these better behaviors, we won't waterboard him, give him a few weeks to kind of start to open up the system, get familiar with the terms, feel out each exercise, try to perfect that first routine, then we can start to progress it. At the same time, I'm telling Scott, hey, Scott, you have a tendency to go wide, crooked foot inside ankle bone low, heavy in your heel. When you notice that throughout the day to day, get your feet close, get your feet straight, and give me those eggshell heels. Same thing in your walk. You're gonna notice yourself walking crooked foot, outside the columns, heavy in the heel. When you notice it, don't get discouraged. That's actually a good chance for a rep. Now bring the feet a little bit closer, Put the feet a little bit straighter and then think eggshell heels when you walk. That'll get you to that ribeye of the foot, the ball of the foot that keeps his ankle unlocked. Now we can start to wash that wave of pressure in a more organized fashion up the column, in and out of it. Any questions on that? That's kind of just a, a snippet of what we do, but the assessment's simple. And it's straightforward and it's centered around what we're built to do, what we're designed to do, right? It's a finite thing. Designed perfectly, which means the room for air is very small. But without the slow motion, this is essentially the new microscope, right? It, it allows us to see what we couldn't see before. Any plans of maybe 3D type lens? Yeah, I mean, we have needed it to yeah. see what we need to see. Just so to walk away, really. Yeah. Quick, if you can't go see it, it's real easy to see it and walk away too. You see the same behavior on the back side. See the foot starts to do this, collapses. Really the heel goes this way. To give you a, a 3D look at that, more or less this is what's happening to all of us as we take, most of us as we take a step. Is the foot, the front of the foot goes this way, the back of the foot goes this way, and then the shin gyro, sort of ball inside, it falls off the platform. And these, this is the root of that chronic pain we talked about. It's a foundation, I gotta get the foot right. This is the same behavior that you'll see on every ACL or every Achilles strength. You'll see this take place. And then it leads to either disharmony between foot and shin or between shin and thigh. The ACL is a disharmony between the shin and the thigh. The Achilles is, is a disharmony between the foot and the shin. One What's thing the that, foot doing when you get to the patient? <coughs> What's that? What's the foot and shin doing that causes the plantar phasis? It's, it's more of what the, where the hips end up at. I mean, the, the feet are starting to open a little bit, but the hips start pushing more into the anterior chain, and then from the back of the neck to the heel is all connected. So as that system closes up and gets compressed, the lift's got to come from somewhere. And if you're a golfer and you're out there taking a bunch of steps, then the feet are gonna take a beating. You can get lower back issues sometimes. You may, I mean, we don't have people come in and could sneeze without throwing their back out. Well, one of them, one of them. You can see it here too. Like remember, if it's supposed to be a half dome structure like this, it's supposed to hold the half dome structure high and strong. When you load, the foot doesn't budge. Well now if you're going into each step and you more or less get to about somewhere here, as all that pressure is sort of gathering into the column, you're stressing out the bottom of your foot, right? So there's some sort of some sort of itis, right? You can almost chalk up all the itises into one category. That would be a non-contact. There's more non-contacts that you have to live through and play through than will put you on the sideline, unfortunately. It's all those chronic little pains that you can't get away from. Yeah, go ahead. Did you see the, the speed training guys? Yes. Were you here for them? Yes. Did you? When they were talking about grip strength, sure. Does that relate to like the biomechanics? What you're seeing in the foot right here, like how strong? Yeah, like you. Yeah, right. The, the outer extremity should be strong. Obviously, we're built to throw and swing, so our grip strength is, is a part of that. Our foot strength is, is super important. Um, what we would say is where you're strong in the foot is more important than anything, right? Like we can fool ourselves with strength sometimes. Um, you'll see people use balance beam tricks or certain other things to create a strong or supple foot. 
but it's not strong inside that sort of behavior of a platform. So you want strong feet, but you want that foot to be inside ankle bone high strong, if that makes sense. So like the spiraling stuff you're talking about, does that happen in like your wrist, or your hands, your forearm? Yeah, your forearm will play like a gyro. If you put your hand on the ground, think of like a basic push-up, you'd have that opening, like the, the elbow pit would be the kneecap then, your foot would be the hand. Think of you're putting yourself in a push-up. Would you want to push up with the thumbs and the index as the main sort of pivot point, or would you kind of lift inside wrist bone high and get more to the strong side of the hand? Right, so you want to be more on the strong side of the hand, the karate chop side, the strong side when you're coming through with your, with your swing. Same idea there. It keeps the wrist inside wrist bone high so that you can unlock the forearm and it can play nicely with everything inside yeah, the I was thinking like wrist and elbows are like what well, golfers, you know, a lot of times are facing and... Yeah, in a lot of, we, so we, we studied the, the UCL and the baseball world, very similar, right? So to give you a quick answer for that, if this hip, and we'll see more of your elbow issues, are coming from your inability to clear the hip. So what's happening on a lot of golfers is, and we see this in my quarterbacks and my, and my uh, pitchers, they'll go to make this move, and the elbow's going. Like the bicep and the forearm are going. It's releasing the club. But you didn't release the shin or the thigh. So now you've got all of this going this way, and this is stuck. Something has to give. So when we looked at all the UCLs, we saw the same thing. The pitcher's heel was actually facing in as the elbow was away. Whereas the healthy throw would be heel away, elbow away, so that each compartment of the chain was on the same page, like puzzle pieces. As one side closes, the other side will open, and vice versa. So more so, or more times than not, we would address the foot and the ankle for an elbow issue. Now we really, what the